The Gospel lesson is from the 20th chapter of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Exactly one week ago, we were here in this place singing and praising and rejoicing in the resurrection of our Lord. After all, it was Easter Sunday. But not for the first disciples. That first Sunday morning after Jesus' death was not Easter for them. Even though the women had told them that their master was alive, the disciples didn't believe them. Since Jesus' death on Friday, they had skulked around town, hoping no one would recognize them, hiding out in a room somewhere in Jerusalem. On the first Easter, the disciples knew only despair and confusion. And then Jesus came. Through the locked doors of that room and through the locked doors of their hearts, Jesus came and he spoke to them. Peace be with you. Now from other lips, at another time, those words would have just been a simple Jewish greeting like hello. But in this place, filled uh, with fear and confusion, spoken by the risen Lord, these simple words accomplished what they promised. Not, I wish you peace, but Peace has come to you. The risen Christ, by his very presence, brings the disciples his peace. His presence in that room was visible proof that death had not won the day, that Jesus himself had overcome death itself. Their teacher had become their savior. Finally, the disciples could know peace. And they were at peace because their Savior had conquered their greatest fear, death. They were at peace because Jesus had returned to comfort them, to give them hope, and to breathe into them his very spirit. For the disciples, Easter didn't come until Sunday evening. It was not until Sunday evening, after most of us had eaten and taken a nap, that his disciples could join in with our morning refrain, He is risen, 
The Lord is risen indeed. But, as you recall, poor Thomas missed out. He was occupied elsewhere when Jesus appeared to the other disciples. And ever since, Thomas has been the object of scorn among Bible readers. Only Judas rivals Thomas for position as the least respected disciple. Thomas the doubter. Thomas the unbeliever. Why would the Gospel writer John include in his book this unflattering story of Thomas? Well, we don't know for sure, but here's a good bet. John was writing his Gospel to a church maybe two generations removed from Christ's death. They'd been certain that Christ's second coming would be in the same generation as those first Christians, but he had not come. And Christians were dying. Some of John's readers felt abandoned by Christ. Some began to doubt. Perhaps some even wondered if Jesus and his apostles had been frauds. So I wonder if John includes this episode with Thomas as a reassurance to those later unsettled doubters. John seems to be saying, look, Thomas doubted that Jesus was alive. He didn't believe the witnesses to Jesus' promises. Like you, he didn't trust second-hand information. So Jesus returned just for Thomas. And then Thomas, trusting in what his eyes saw and what his fingers felt, believed in Jesus, the conqueror of death. And the scene concludes with a remark by Jesus that could well have been directed at John's nervous readers down the line. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Well, maybe we should look past John's original audience to more contemporary Christians. Us. Maybe Jesus' treatment of Thomas will allow us to look a little more honestly at our own faith. Many of us, probably most of us, have something in common with Thomas. We are people who have doubts. We are people who often need proofs for our beliefs or at least something concrete to base our belief on. Certainly we'd like more than hearsay to believe in these outrageous claims of resurrection faith. But basically our faith is built on second-hand information from scripture writers, from pastors in the pulpit, from parents and friends in Christ, we are indeed called to believe, having not seen. But 20th century enlightened Americans aren't taught that way. Seeing is believing. Even in our faith, I think we have sometimes fallen for science's criteria for belief. If we can observe and, and manipulate it and replicate it, It's real, and if we can't in some sense hold something in the palm of our hand and control it, it's not to be trusted. But resurrection cannot be held in our hand. We cannot grasp it and control it. Sometimes, then, we cannot always live as if resurrection is real. And if that's true for us, let's just at least admit it. To admit that we are not perfect Christians. Our faith has dents and holes and weak places. Like Thomas, many of us would like to see to believe. But the little secret of this story in John is that Jesus honored this doubter. Jesus did not shrink from Thomas. Jesus made a special trip. Not to rebuke Thomas for his faithlessness, but to provide what Thomas needed to believe. Now, I think this action by Jesus gives us two wonderful and freeing gifts. And I think the first gift is this one, that we can be honest about our faith or our lack of it. We can be honest about our doubts and our weaknesses, our questions about faith in the world, We can admit that we don't have it all together, that we don't have all the answers. And I hope this church is a kind of place where we can talk without shame about our fears and our struggles and our doubts, even when our status as rock-solid believer might be threatened by that. 
I worked with uh, Wake Forest Campus Ministry in the late uh, 80s. And I would have to say that for some of that time, the Lutheran student group took that particular gift to heart. For several months, they had been discussing questions like, how do we know that God is? How do we know that God is for us? And the students had been very open about sharing their struggles with these fundamental faith questions. They could do that because their doubts and struggles were not met with rebuke, but with love. But not everyone thought that conversation was befitting a campus ministry. Our student campus ministry coordinator uh, would attend uh, with other student campus ministry leaders uh, on occasional meetings. And during one of those meetings, the campus minister, the, Luth- the one that was oversaw the group, leading the meeting, asked the students to share what issues the different campus groups uh, were dealing with. And the other students shared their discussions of whether it was real wine or really grape juice at the Last Supper, or how Jesus would want us to treat each other on a date. Uh, The campus minister asked then the Lutheran student leader what the Lutherans were talking about. And she said, the existence of God. And there was this uncomfortable silence. And the campus minister just looked at his feet. And she thought, well, apparently there's some of those questions that we should keep to ourselves. Now, when I heard that story, part of me was a little proud that the Lutheran students could discuss openly even the most fundamental questions of faith. On the other hand, I did worry for a while that Lutherans would become known as the remedial God group at Wake Forest. (laughs) Jesus came to a doubting Thomas without rebuke, but with love and compassion. And I do hope that this church can offer such love and compassion for those here on the inside or who are on the outside who doubt, who are not perfect, who are not yet complete. To quote Martin Luther, we are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. In other words, we haven't arrived yet. None of us have, but we are on the way, and that's okay. That brings me to the second gift that Jesus gives us. When we read this story, we always remember that Jesus blessed those who would believe without seeing Jesus in the flesh. But remember this too. Jesus also blessed Thomas, who needed to see to believe. Jesus returned to that room just for Thomas, just so Thomas could have what he needed to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and God. So what has Jesus given you to help you believe that he lives? Last Sunday morning, right before dawn, I was standing on the corner of Church and Bank Street playing trombone, only passably. And then in the quiet, listen, and then in the quiet I was listening to the other bands playing around Salem, ultimately converging on God's acre. And I watched as Thousands walked silently by that place. Silently, all of them. Now I grant a a non-believer might look on that scene as kind of a quaint tradition, but for me it was a gift of Christ for the building up of my own faith. Christ was truly present, and I believe that he gave me that same promise of peace that he gave his own disciples. And it was an invitation to touch and listen and see the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. For the last six months ago or so, we have been concluding our board meetings with this question. Where is God moving in our work together? What evidence do we have that God is up to something around here? What can we point to? Well, that's a good discipline for a body made up of people that we ask to lead and guide the Church of Jesus Christ. And let's just say we are still practicing. 
As Luther said, this is not the end, it is the way. And we'll, we're still learning. But I also recommend that practice to all of you. At the end of the day, take a little quiet time to ask yourself, where has God been moving if, in, with, and under the tasks and events of this day? What was God up to today? Because God is up to something. The days of Jesus coming through the locked doors of our hearts and bringing us peace, giving us his Holy Spirit, and sending us out into a needy world, those days are not over. It still happens. And it will happen to us if we pay attention. And I will lift up Doubting Thomas as a model for us. Thomas was not convinced of the good news of Jesus' resurrection. But he kept coming back. He didn't give up. And Jesus came back too, just for Thomas. So whatever questions you have, let those questions draw you further into the body of Christ, not away from it. Because it's probably here among these people and in the word proclaimed and in the sacraments and in our study together and in lives of service with your brothers and sisters that God will grace you with what answers are possible in this life, and you will meet the risen Jesus. Amen.